to occult experiments in the home, magic, spirituality and the paranormal, in personal experience and in practice. As we've explored in previous episodes, there's certainly no scientific evidence for ghosts in the sense that although people go on experiencing them, no one has yet furnished any evidence that casts any meaningful light on what a ghost is, or even if those experiences that we call ghosts are even one type of thing. I've argued here previously that there probably never will be any evidence for ghosts, because they don't exist in any material sense. And yet, I strongly suspect that as long as there are human beings on the planet, they will always have experiences of ghosts, and they will need a concept of a ghost in order to make sense of those experiences. But what is there to gain, if anything, from encounters with the paranormal? Whatever that might be, it doesn't seem to include the knowledge of supposedly paranormal entities. If someone has a strange experience, then either it's explained in terms of something already known, or it remains unknown, a mystery. However, I think there are benefits to exploring and encountering the paranormal. There is even a practice, a psycho-spiritual practice, that entails opening ourselves to paranormal experiences, leading to certain kinds of benefits. It's an ancient practice, stretching all the way back to a semi-legendary Tibetan Buddhist teacher who lived in the 11th century. And I'm going to talk about my own engagement with this practice, or a contemporary version of it perhaps. This all happened quite a few years ago now, back in 2010. I was working in the IT department for the local council, the local branch of government in the city of Brighton and Hove. One of the things about working in an IT department, I think, when you're within an organisation, is that every part of that organisation these days relies on IT. So I used to get to meet and work with all sorts of people in all sorts of different departments of the local government. And from time to time I'd sometimes come across stories about ghosts. Some of the buildings that the local council was housed in at that time were very old and a few had a bit of a murky, creepy history to them. The building that consistently produced reports of strange experiences was Brighton Town Hall. Supposedly the ghostly figure of a monk had been seen in and around the building. But it was the basement of the building that seemed to be associated with the maximum spookiness. I encountered stories from colleagues about workmen whose equipment had been locked up overnight and when they'd come back the following morning they'd found their tools scattered all around rooms in the basement that they'd been working in. Supposedly certain members of staff who'd worked there for years tended to avoid the basement regions and were very reluctant to talk about the spooky experiences that they'd had. But, as is so often the case with these kinds of stories, when I attempted to probe a bit deeper, it was very difficult to discover any solid accounts of who saw what when. And it was hard to tell whether this was because people were reluctant to talk about it, or because maybe the stories were all of that type that get told to us by a friend of a friend. But I did come across a direct report from a colleague in the IT department who'd been working in the basement one day. And she and another colleague had been really shocked when a door that was propped open at one end of the room 
suddenly slammed violently shut without any trace of a breeze at all. And my colleague reported a very strange sense of it feeling as if something had slammed that door shut, as if there'd been a kind of intentionality in the slamming, which had really alarmed her. On the scale of ghostly incidents, this is fairly minor, but I did take the time to interview her and interviewed her colleagues separately and got them to draw diagrams and describe what they remembered and the stories seemed to match up. As minor as it was, that door slamming did seem quite inexplicable. Perhaps it's small wonder that creepy stuff was happening down in that basement. The town hall was built in 1832 and from the very beginning of the building and right up into the 1960s it was used by the local police force to house their headquarters. The basement was the place where the cells were. Certainly during the time I worked in the building there was no natural light in the basement portions. People, some of them not very nice people who had maybe done dreadful things, and they were locked up down there in the dark and the cold in that basement area for a period of time, with prisoners coming and going, extending well over a hundred years. And as if that weren't enough of a murky history, before the town hall, more or less on the same spot, there had stood the Priory of St. Bartholomew. According to the historical records that have come down, the Priory was badly damaged in 1514 when a party of French invaders launched a surprise raid on Brighton and pretty much looted and burnt the village to the ground before they were fought off. And later, of course, the Priory came to a final end in the late 1540s after King Henry VIII confiscated all the assets of the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries. In the basement of Brighton Town Hall, still to this day, there's a covered entrance to a deep well that still contains water and was once apparently the well for the Priory the source of water for the monks that live there. A correlation has often been posited between ghosts and other kinds of supernatural activity and underground water, whether that's because we suppose the water provides some sort of strange energy source for supernatural manifestations, or whether we suppose instead that water underground might produce, I don't know, weird noises or vibrations that are often misperceived as ghosts. Who knows? But there is certainly underground water on the site of Brighton Town Hall. And not only that, but also in the basement are some really strong electromagnetic fields, which have also been correlated with spooky activity. In the basement there's a lot of equipment to do with the building's power supply. It's been suggested that under certain circumstances electromagnetic fields can have a physical effect on the human brain, which perhaps can alter our perception in certain ways. So that was one of the buildings that I worked in back in 2010, and at that time, apart from storage, there wasn't much use for those basement areas. But some of it had been taken up by the establishment of a small museum called the Old Police Cells Museum, which contained an array of interesting artefacts such as old types of uniforms and truncheons and other bits of kit that the police in Brighton had used down the centuries. But perhaps the most impactful part of the museum was their renovation of the cells. A couple of corridors in the basement have been 
cleared out and set up to try and illustrate what the cells might have been like back in the day when there were prisoners in them. Also, back then I was a big fan of the paranormal TV show Most Haunted, which, as far as I'm aware, was the original paranormal reality show. But the thing that bugged me about Most Haunted, well, one of the things that bugged me about Most Haunted, was how, when something unusual actually happened, everybody would just run away screaming. Supposedly they were going into places to investigate paranormal phenomena, but as soon as anything strange presented itself, they'd immediately run in the opposite direction. This is understandable, of course, because the places they were exploring were very, very spooky indeed. But it did make me wonder, what would I do in that situation? Could I actually fare any better? I decided to try and find out. I had a very haunted place, reputedly, very much to hand, the place where I worked. So I made some enquiries to see if it would be possible for me to spend the night alone, completely in the dark, in the haunted police cells. I think it must have been around August that I had the idea, so just to make it as creepy as possible. This obviously had to be done on the night of Halloween. And to make sure that I couldn't get cold feet and back out, I decided to make it into a fundraising event. So I asked people to sponsor me to last the night in there without leaving. And whatever money I was going to raise, I would split equally between the museum and a national mental health charity. And to my great surprise, I got the agreement to go ahead with this. Over the weeks that followed, I managed to raise about £1,100, I think it was. So I knew I had to go ahead with it now. I couldn't back out. And far more quickly than I would have liked, suddenly Halloween was rolling into view. I was actually going to have to do this thing. At the time, I even had a phobia of the dark. I always slept with the light on. (laughs) I started to think about how I was going to deal with the experience of being all alone in a dark and haunted place. And I'd heard stories about Buddhist monks meditating in scary cemeteries or at night in places where tigers were known to roam. So I started to think that what might help me through the night would be meditating. And I realised that what I was about to undertake was, in a way, a contemporary form of an ancient practice, a Tibetan Buddhist practice known as Cho. This is a practice devised and taught by a yogini, female meditation master by the name of Magic Lab Dron. And she was born in Tibet around the middle of the 11th century and apparently lived into her 90s. And she formulated and taught this practice known as Cho, which is a type of meditation that seeks to cut the meditator's attachment to their sense of body, their sense of corporeal manifestation. The idea, the assumption that we have a separate existence in a physical body is one of the main sources of the illusion of duality. Just to think about that briefly, we really do have a sense that there's this thing called the physical body Yet we only have to reflect a little bit to notice that everything we regard and experience as physical is coming to us through the mind as a mental experience. In reality there isn't and there can't be any distinct separation between these things that we call body and mind. So in order to confront this experientially, 
what the practitioner of Cho does is basically to make an offering of their body, to surrender it, to give it up, to cut off our preoccupation with it and our attachment to it. And one of the means of achieving that is to go off into a haunted place, a dreaded place, a lonely place, a place likely to arouse sensations of fear, which of course is fear that harm may befall the body. And in those places to willingly, to consciously give in to that fear and give up the body. So if it's assumed that in the place where we're meditating there might be ghosts or demons, then we willingly surrender our body up to those ghosts or demons for them to feed upon and to do with whatever they like. Now, on the face of it, this sounds like total insanity. Giving up your body to allow demons to feast upon it. What good could possibly come of that? So... I'll allow Magic Labdron herself to explain, and I apologise for my pronunciation of her name, which is only my phonetic attempt at how her name is usually rendered into English. And what follows is a really lovely translation of Magic Labdron, produced in 2013 by Sarah Harding. Son, listen, says Magic Labdron. These are the characteristics of devils. That which is called devil is not some actual great big black thing that scares and petrifies whomever sees it. A devil is anything that obstructs the achievement of freedom. Therefore, even loving and affectionate friends become devils with regard to freedom. Most of all, there is no greater devil than this fixation to a self. So until this ego fixation is cut off, all the devils wait with open mouths. For that reason, you need to exert yourself at a skillful method to sever the devil of ego fixation. What she's pointing out there, I think, is that just as the body and the ego are the product of dualistic illusion, therefore so are Devils, demons, ghosts. This idea that they're an actual separate something out there, rather than, like everything, a product of mind. So, given that, here's some of the guidance she gives for dealing with what manifests as any kind of disturbing paranormal manifestation. Listen, son, she says. The intangible devil arises like this, so pay attention and don't let your mind wander. That which is called the intangible devil does not appear as an actual object of the senses. Rather, it is any of the good or bad concepts that arise in your own mind. They are called demons when you apprehend them as frightful appearances that cause terror and call gods when you apprehend them as pure appearances that cause cheerful and pleasurable experiences. In that way, the mental grasping at the two concepts of good and bad conditions the mind to become afflicted with emotion, although afflictive emotion is without actual tangibility and there is no real actual object it has the ability to inflict certain harm by causing you to stray into unvirtuous actions. So it is called a devil. The mind itself that fixates on the duality of faults and qualities such as the good god and the bad demon has never itself had even a hair tip's worth of actual reality in its own basic ground. Therefore it is known as groundless rootless emptiness. Don't try to block the sensations and such that arise in the mind. Also, don't block any of the various good or bad thoughts and memories. Don't even entertain any notions about them. Whatever thoughts and memories arise, don't hold on to them by dwelling and reflecting on them. 
mind itself, is the clear nature of vast space, and any thought or memory whatsoever can arise within it just as waves and such can appear in the ocean without a mover, so any kind of good or bad thoughts arise in the mind. If you let the mind rest in its own place without interfering, the intangible devil will be overcome by splendour, eliminating mental dualistic grasping and letting the mind relax into its own state without disturbance will liberate the intangible devil in its own place, noble son. Taking on board what she says there, maybe it's possible to see how giving away your body as an offering to demons might indeed be a bit of a problem if we give credence to this notion that demons are some objective separate thing. But if we do instead what she suggests that we do, which is to meet what's going on in the mind as a mental event, seeing the experience as an experience, rather than getting carried away by the apparent contents or story of that experience, then the demons or whatever are just like everything else, just like waves on the surface of a body of water that will eventually pass away of their own accord. So that's the theory of Cho, and it sounds pretty simple and straightforward, but I was prepared that once I was on my own in a dark and haunted place, maybe the practice of it wasn't going to be as easy as it sounded, and that indeed proved to be the case. So September came, and I was publicising the event and collecting sponsorship money. And then another opportunity presented itself. A local paranormal investigation group got in touch. They'd heard about what I was planning and they had rented out the Old Police Cells Museum for the night in order to do a paranormal investigation. And they invited me to come along and join them which was a brilliant opportunity because it would give me a chance to see what the place was like at night and look around and get a sense of the different areas and how to get between them. The paranormal group were doing the usual kind of things that paranormal groups do. They got lots of equipment, sound recording equipment, video recording equipment and EMF detectors and ghost boxes and motion sensors. And we spent a fairly enjoyable evening attempting to make contact with any spirits that might be in that place with the usual kind of vague, inconclusive, yet at times oddly intriguing sorts of results that tend to arise from that kind of approach. The museum was split over two floors, an upper basement area and a lower basement area. And the upper basement was organised along two separate corridors, and this was where the cells were located. Along one of the corridors were the cells that had been used for female prisoners, who would often, back in the day, be accompanied by their children. And this part of... The museum was a little bit more salubrious. It only felt to me kind of slightly spooky. But the other corridor where the male cells were, that was a very different atmosphere indeed. It had a distinctly uncomfortable feel about it that seemed somehow miserable and depressing, but at the same time with an edge of hostility to it. The level below the cells, the lower basement, was even gloomier and colder than the level above. There was a open, echoey space, mostly empty, that formerly were the washrooms and toilets. And then there was another area full of storage racks, which once upon a time would have stored all the uniforms and equipment. 
But then there was another area which still contained an original fireplace. And this was where the chief constable's office had once been. That fireplace in the lower basement was the exact location of the most notorious incident associated with the town hall. In 1844, the chief constable of Brighton was a man named Henry Solomon. On the 13th of March, a 23-year-old by the name of John Lawrence was detained in the station, suspected of stealing a carpet. Lawrence had been noticed to be behaving a bit oddly in the cells, so Solomon had had him brought down to his office, where there was a fire and where it was a bit more comfortable, to have a one-to-one talk with him. The accounts differ on what happened next, but either Lawrence was left alone by himself for a while, or Solomon made the mistake of turning his back but Lawrence picked up a poker from the fireplace and attacked Solomon with it and gave him a head injury that was so bad that he died the next day. This earned Henry Solomon the very unfortunate distinction of being the only British chief constable to have been murdered in his own police station. It's sad that Solomon is remembered these days mostly for the way that he died and also for the stories that have lingered that his ghost haunts the basement of the town hall. But like so many historical ghost stories, I wasn't able to find any accounts of anyone who stated they'd seen Solomon's ghost. As far as I'm aware, the idea that Solomon's ghost appears in the town hall is really just a bit of a folk tale. What Solomon more properly deserves to be remembered for are his achievements in life. He was Jewish and being appointed to chief constable at that time when society was more anti-Semitic than it is today It was a notable achievement, and not only that, Solomon was evidently really popular and really well liked by the populace of the town. After he died, there was a big public funeral for him, and Queen Victoria herself donated a substantial sum to the appeal for support for his widow and nine children. As might be imagined after... His actions, things did not go well for John Lawrence. He was arrested and tried and publicly hanged about a month later. The night I spent alone in the dark in the basement, I came away with a sense that maybe something peculiar is going on there. But whatever that might be, I couldn't see any real reason for linking it to the death of Henry Solomon. The night I spent there with the paranormal investigators in September, despite our best efforts to make contact with the spirit of Solomon through the ghost box and the Ouija board, none of this produced any meaningful results. And that was pretty much what I'd expected, and I hadn't really expected to experience anything out of the ordinary at all. So I was really surprised and a little bit perturbed when something a little bit strange did actually happen. The team split up, and each of us, along the corridor where the male cells were, we each got inside one of the cells and closed the door and turned out the lights and sat alone for a while in complete blackness to see if we noticed anything interesting or out of the ordinary. So I was sitting there in this cell by myself and suddenly, as if it were coming from behind me, I sensed 
a very sharp, unpleasant, but immediately recognisable smell. The smell of unwashed bodies. Now, I'd had a shower before I came out, so I was pretty sure that it wasn't me. And this smell came with a weird, oppressive feeling. Uh, Like I mentioned, it was as if it were coming up from behind me. As if it had a definite direction and point of space associated with it. So I sat noticing this smell for a while. And then I decided it was a bit too creepy and I'd had enough. And I snapped on my torch and instantly it went away. And it struck me, that's a bit odd that a smell would go away just because you've turned a light on. But for the time that I'd been sitting there noticing it, I'd had a good chance to really have a good look at this experience of the smell. And as I looked at it, I realised that it wasn't actually a smell at all. Suppose I say now the word parmesan or burning rubber, depending on how active your olfactory imagination might be. When you hear those words, you might suddenly get a strong sense of a smell from your imagination. That was what I was experiencing as I sat in that cell. It wasn't a smell. It was the image of a smell. It was mental in nature. It was arising from the mind rather than through physical perception. Now, that was odd because although I'd realised that the smell was coming entirely from my imagination, I wasn't intending (laughs) to imagine it. I wasn't making myself imagine the smell of unwashed bodies. So, where had that idea come from? One possibility, perhaps, is that the experience is arising from the interaction of a place and a mind. I knew the history of that place. I imagine that back in the day, the smell of unwashed bodies was maybe one of the least objectionable odours that would have been present. But are such experiences caused completely by internal suggestion? Could it be that there are all sorts of possible environmental cues and triggers that interact with the mind and stimulate the imagination completely unconsciously to produce experiences that, although they might not be physical perceptions of things, nevertheless are actual mental images of things. Often it can be very difficult to distinguish between the two. And for the person having the experience, often the difference between the two makes very little practical difference. Whether I actually perceive a smell of unwashed bodies or simply experience a vivid mental image of that smell, its effect on me is going to be pretty much the same in either case. In practical terms, it doesn't really matter whether it was perceived or imagined. The difference does become a lot more significant, however, when there's more than one person involved, maybe. So this experience had given me a bit of a taste of what it was maybe going to be like on the big night itself. I would be having unsettling experiences, but in order to maintain the Cho practice... I would need to try to curb my reactions to these and just stay with it and carefully observe it and see what it, what its true nature really was. So finally the day came and the first hour was fine. We were doing publicity photos and showing various people around who had come and offered their support. And I was chatting with the security guard who would be on duty far, far away upstairs throughout the night. And then it was time to go down into one of the cells on the female inmate's corridor. Which I'd chosen because (laughs) it seemed less spooky than the male cells. And I turned out the lights and the night began. So I got a strong LED torch with me and uh, 
a torch on a headband as well. And I also had a couple of video cameras, one with night vision that I was intending to use to keep a running commentary of what happened throughout the night. It would start to be getting light at about 6am in the morning, so I divided the night up into blocks of time, most of which I would spend sitting in meditation, but I also resolved to get up at regular intervals and take the video camera and explore each part of the museum. I was uh, pretty scared down there, scared to a lesser or greater degree throughout the entire night, even though I was all alone. The first thing I noticed was how much noise there was down there in the quiet. Layers and layers of vibratory sounds, like electrical noises and piping and muffled noises as well from outside the building as people were going between the bars and the restaurants that were around the town hall. When I listened deeply into the noise, I noticed what my imagination was doing with them. It was like I could hear moaning and mumbling and voices in the noise. And they tended to sound like women's voices. And again, I was noticing how my imagination seemed to be creating experiences in accordance with what I knew and perhaps expected from that environment. Sometimes there'd be the odd crack or creak that would make me jump. Usually I couldn't pinpoint a source for these, but it was probably the display cases or items in the museum just contracting or settling in the coolness of the night. So I got on with sitting and meditating and alternating this with getting up and taking the video camera around. But it was sometime just after 2am in the morning when anxiety turned into outright fear. I was speaking a progress report into the video camera when I heard footsteps coming down the stairs towards the cells really, really clearly. And I assumed it was the security guard coming down to tell me something. But instead of coming into the cells, the footsteps stopped short. And then there was a noise like somebody trying a door handle and pushing against a door. And part of this, the loudest bit, is heard really clearly on the soundtrack of the video footage. It was so loud it stopped me in mid-sentence. So this, at least, was something that clearly wasn't imagined. It was actually picked up by the, the video camera. No security guard came in. I was just sitting there with my heart hammering in my mouth. The sounds just stopped, faded away, and there was no sound of whoever it was going back up the stairs. The whole thing just came to a dead stop. Maybe that wouldn't have been too odd in itself, but a while later, it happened again. Footsteps coming down the stairs. I even wondered again if it was the security guard. But instead of a door being shaken, this time the footsteps ended with a sound that seemed to be rattling keys, as if somebody was trying a set of keys in a lock over and over, looking for the right one. And once more, after a while, the sound just weirdly faded, drifted away. The meditation practice was really helping me deal with the fear. But it wasn't helping me in the sense that it got rid of the fear, because I was really, really scared. If you can imagine, I'm down there in the dark by myself and there's something moving around down there. I had a very vivid sense that I wasn't alone. What the practice was doing was it was enabling me to recognise and accept 
the fear. And it taught me a lesson that has stayed with me, which is that once you're afraid, it really helps to recognise that fear has now done its thing to you. Fear cannot do anything to you other than make you feel afraid. Once you're scared, there's nothing else to do, there's nowhere else to take it, other than to let yourself be scared. It's a sensation in the body. That's what fear is, and seeing that, being with that, as fully and as clearly as we can, in a way helps us deal with it. Fear is all about desperately needing to get away from something, and when it seems as if we can't do that, then panic is generally what results. But recognising how fear is a sensation in the body, a signal, that can help. But after a point, I started to realise that the meditator in me was in conflict with the paranormal investigator. Spooky stuff was happening, spooky experiences were actually arising, and... The meditator was seeing through the way the mind turns that into some kind of external object. However, this sense that I was not alone, did that mean that there was actually a ghost coming down the stairs, rattling doors, rattling keys? It was all very well that I was dealing with the terror of this experience, but Shouldn't I get my video cam and get out there and see if I could capture something? What if there was some actual evidence of the paranormal out there that I was missing? What swayed it for me was the idea that there might be something even more scary on the other side of the cell door. So the next time I heard the noises I resolved to get up and take the video camera. And if there truly was something going on outside, then that would give the meditator side of me even more to chew on. So, the next time I heard those footsteps approaching, and it must have been around 3am in the morning by now, I was ready, and I grabbed the video camera and I stood up. And then, in a weird way, what was probably the strangest thing of the whole evening happened which was as soon as I stood up and headed towards the door, the sounds retreated. It was as if instead of coming down the stairs, the footsteps went back up. And I had a very strong sense that somehow, whatever it was, knew what I was planning and was avoiding me. But, luckily, there was another opportunity. It was about 4am and the footsteps came down the stairs again, so this time I let them approach. I didn't want to startle whatever it was away like last time. And then again, when they'd reached wherever they'd reached, there was this sound of rattling keys. And now that it had come down the stairs and was working its way through the keys, or, or so it sounded, I decided this was the moment. So I got up, grabbed the video camera, opened my cell door, stepped out into the corridor, and then received the biggest shock of the night. The sound wasn't as far away as it sounded inside the cell. The sound, the rattling sound, was coming right from the cell next door to mine. For my base, I'd chosen a cell along the female corridor, which was the second one along as you enter the corridor. The one next door, the first cell, the cell from inside of which the noises were coming, was the only cell that was permanently locked. It had a sign on it saying staff only, and it was secured by a very sturdy looking modern lock. But the noises were inside that cell. I could hear them coming through the door. And when I was up close against the door, the noises from inside sounded less like rattling keys. 
but more like someone rifling desperately through packaging or plastic, as if they were in some sort of anxious state or a panic, as if they were looking for something desperately. It felt so weird and somehow sad to hear a sound like that at twenty past four in the morning in the pitch dark, as if someone was searching frantically about for something that they couldn't find. And then I found myself doing something that, even at the time, I found difficult to believe. I knocked on the door. And I said, hello, can I help you? (laughs) And I realised that even though I was absolutely terrified at the same time, I was worried about whatever was in there. I wanted to check it was okay. And I asked if there was anything I could do to help it. I expected when... I knocked on the door that the noise would stop, but it didn't. It carried on just as before. The door was locked, but above the door of every cell was an open space with bars. And I realised that even though I couldn't get up there and look over, I could reach up with the video camera and point the video camera inside. So that's what I did, and... Even with the video camera pointing in, the sound still continued. Eventually, I went back to my cell. I sat down, carried on meditating, and still I could hear these sounds from next door. And still I was afraid. I was shaking, I was trembling, and my mind kept producing images of what it supposed might be next door in that cell. But I carried on with the practice, and even though it didn't make the fear go away, as I mentioned, it remained at a level where I could function, where I could operate, where I could be aware of the fear, and also be aware of other things, such as feelings of wanting whatever it was to be okay, wanting to check that it was all right, or or if there was anything I could do to help. A Tibetan Buddhist teacher of the 16th century named Kunkien Pema Karpo, he advised the following. Viewing them to be gods and associated demons, he said, is a mistake and results in seeming divine influences occurring in this lifetime. When recognising the act of holding them to be gods and demons, these influences become transmuted into special psychic powers. I don't know if what I've just described constitutes a special psychic power, but I'd never before experienced or imagined that it was possible to experience being afraid and terrified and yet being concerned for somebody else and wanting to help them at the same time. It's an interesting point being made there, maybe. If we can catch our mind in the act of making a god or a demon out of an experience, then maybe somehow we can liberate something that would ordinarily have got bound up in the act of doing that, and in that process access non-ordinary states of mind, where capacities beyond the ordinary perhaps become possible. So there I sat, meditating with those sounds coming from the cell next door, and after about half an hour or so, they just gradually faded away. I daren't look at whatever the video camera had captured over the top of the door, just in case. It proved to be something that I couldn't handle. But when I played back the footage in the morning when the daylight had come, Although the sounds can clearly be heard coming from inside the cell, there wasn't any obviously apparent source for them. It was difficult to think up a physical explanation. If it was a breeze or a draught of some kind that was rattling objects in the room, 
it was a bit odd that it was an episodic breeze rather than a constant one. I wondered about rats or mice and I spoke to the security guard after and he'd worked in the building for 20 years and said he'd never known there to be any vermin in the building in that time. I even wondered about some sort of insect or a big spider scurrying around. But it would have to have been an absolute whopper to have made the noises that it did. There was nothing especially spooky that happened after the sounds had faded away. And by six o'clock in the morning, I heard the sound of birds and girls and the city starting to wake up. I put the lights back on and did a final tour of the site and spoke out loud to the spirits of the place, just in case there were any there to hear me, and wished them well, and performed banishing rituals around the site. And then it was time to come back up, time to gather my stuff and leave, and return back to the friends who got up early that morning to welcome me back. So strange. Such an interesting experience and such a privilege to get the opportunity to do it. When I look back now, one of the oddest things about what I experienced was how what I heard initially, footsteps coming downstairs, banging doors, rattling keys, seemed to change as soon as I got that video camera and stepped out into the corridor and discovered that the sounds I was hearing were coming from the cell next door. One sort of experience morphed into a completely other sort of experience. What sounded like echoing footsteps and jangling metal coming from a distance then became a sound of scrabbling, rifling, searching coming from a really close place. Was it the same sound being heard, being perceived differently? Was it two sets of sounds or a mixture of things? It all comes down to what's perceived by the mind and what sense the mind makes of those perceptions. That's the only real answer I'm ever likely to get to those questions. And... On that gloriously indeterminate note, that's it for this episode. I hope it's thrown up some interesting things to think about. To keep the podcast going, remember that you can support it and access additional material by signing up at Patreon. Take a look at patreon.com slash oeith if you're interested in doing that or you can send a one-off donation of whatever you like if you found this episode useful or any of the other ones there's information in the notes with this episode giving ways to do that patrons by the way will be getting access to the video that I mentioned that contains what the video camera captured on that night back in 2010. So do check Patreon if you're already signed up for that. Take care, my lovely, and I hope that we get to speak again soon. Bye-bye.